Programming can take a lot of time, and I can't totally alleviate that problem, but I can help you work effectively and maybe think about programming in a different way. The main thing that you need to do when approaching a new problem is to ensure that you understand that problem. Work through a bunch of examples on paper before you try to code anything at all. The biggest mistake that beginning programmers make is to start coding too early. In fact, I recommend that you start thinking through your code on paper as well. Try your code, your paper code, on your paper examples. See how it works. When you get ready to code, make sure that you've got tests there so that you can see when you get it right. And work incrementally. Don't try to solve an entire problem at once. So let's look at how you would handle one little piece of a problem. I suggest you pick one of your examples. So after you've sort of understood the big idea, pick one of your examples, pick one case, and try to work through it. I want you to work through it on paper, but not in a vague way. Don't be satisfied with sort of vague ideas of, oh, I'm moving through the list or blah. No, we need precise names for variables, precise state of the machine. Think about what the variable name is that's going to move you through the list, whether it's i or x or whatever. Think about all the other variables that you need to store. Think about how the computer will modify those variables as the execution proceeds. In order to program a computer, you need to think like a computer. Then, before you start coding your actual solution, code up a test or make sure you have one. I've given you lots of tests in the homework, so you can often skip this for homework problems. But when you're developing your own code, you want to make sure that you have a test so that you know when you got the code right. Then finally, you can type in the code. And if you have any problems, use a debugger. Use sensible debugging techniques. You don't want to just try the first thing that comes to your head. You need to go back to principles and think about what happened. So what you're going to do is pick each example, work through it, and once you've got code that covers all of your examples, then you're done. You start writing any repetitive task working in the middle. Assume that you're halfway through your problem and you just need to make one step of progress. After you've done the middle, you can worry about how to end and how to begin the process. I talked a lot more about this in the video on loops. When you have problems, you need to be principled in how you debug. You want to make sure that you understand why you have a problem before you attempt to change anything. If you don't understand why there's a problem, you're probably going to change the wrong thing. So make sure you understand where the problem is, how the computer executed it, in order to solve the particular problem you're having. You know, the computer is not thinking in big picture. Uh, computers deal with details. They work on the little bits of code that you wrote down. So something where, in somewhere where you wrote it, the computer's following the process you told it, and somehow you've told it something that is not quite right. So what's happening there is the code you've written doesn't match the idea that you have in your head. That may be because you just have a typo. It may also be because the idea that you have in your head is a little unclear. So it's important to clarify that before you move forward. Go back and think about how to solve the problem before you fix anything. In order to succeed in this class, it's not sufficient to simply complete the homeworks once and have them done. You need to make sure you've internalized the homeworks and that you really understand the solution. And in order to do that, I encourage you to redo homeworks until you can do any given homework problem in five minutes or less. So once you've got a solution, you should try to clean up your code as much as possible. Try to make it so it's self-explanatory to any average programmer. Use meaningful names for everything in your program, except maybe induction variables like the iterator through an array or through a linked list. You can call those things like i or x, but other variables should have meaningful names. And get rid of unnecessary code. 
once you've cleaned up your code, create a copy of it and delete all your solutions. Leave for a day, come back the next day and try to type them in. All right. So it's fine if that first solution took you a week. It's fine if that first solution took you a month. It's fine if you had to call 100 friends and, and look on the Internet. That's all OK. It's important to use resources to, to figure out how to do things. But it's also important to know that you need to be responsible for understanding this yourself. So you, you can use resources, but you can't become dependent on them. So anytime you go off and you, you ask somebody, hey, can you help me with this? It's incumbent upon you to then say, well, OK, I asked my friend. He helped me out. Now I need to redo this myself without my friend just to make sure I've really got it. And you can do this repeatedly. Wake up the next day. Try to redo the problems. Don't look at a previous solution. Don't ask for help. Hopefully you can get it down. If you do need help, then you need to repeat this. That's fine. Get some help. Repeat the process. Try to do this over and over again until you can complete the problem by yourself without looking at your previous solution, without asking for help, and you can do it in five minutes or less. If you can do that, then you can really say, I've understood this problem and, and you're in good shape. To consolidate even more, you can come up with a small variation of the problem and then solve it. What I'm getting at here is the difference between familiarity and understanding. You might see a solution to a loop. You might recognize the code in the book and you're like, yeah, I know that's right. I know how to do that. I see the loop. That doesn't mean that you can actually do it yourself. People often mistake familiarity and understanding, says the Chronicle of Higher Education. They open the textbook after getting home from a lecture. They recognize the material. They think, I get this. Then they take a test and they bomb it. If you follow my suggestions for the homework, this will not happen to you. If you can do every homework problem in five minutes or less, then you've really learned the material and you'll be able to repeat it on an exam. You'll be able to repeat it in a future job interview. Like any human activity, there are patterns of behavior, patterns of thought in computer programming. And what you'll learn in this course are patterns of problem solving, like working from the middle, working incrementally, being incredibly precise. You'll also learn specific techniques for writing code to deal with very specific situations, like I need to go through an array, I need to go through a linked list. And in the following course, you'll see how to go through trees, how to go through graphs. Learning these patterns is very important. If you walk into a job interview and they ask you to write a loop over an array and you look at them like it's the first time you've ever seen it, you're not going to get the job. You need to have internalized the basic patterns of programming. And that's what this course is for. It's intended to give you time to do this. Think about a sport that you like, maybe tennis. You don't expect to learn tennis by watching a couple YouTube videos and then maybe hitting a forehand once. That's not going to cut it. You need to practice your forehand. You need to like go out and hit the ball. Just like anyone can learn tennis, anyone can learn to program. And just like in tennis, it's important not to give up the first time you hit a ball wrong. It's important in programming to not give up just because you're having a little bit of difficulty. You need to think of programming like a play activity. I tried to construct the homework assignments to facilitate that. You have a bunch of tests for each problem, and the tests will tell you whether or not you get the solution right. I've done this to encourage you to try different solutions, to try varying your code so that you can actually experiment. You can play with writing code. The only way to become a really good programmer is to play with programming. If you hit a rough space, you may say, well, oh, I just can't do this. And maybe you go ask a friend and the friend helps you out. And that's fine. But it's important that you get over this idea that you can't do it. You can do it. If you can write it once with the help of a friend, then you can internalize that and write it yourself. It's just a matter of practice. You need to get into the intellectual habit of thinking in a certain way. 
Don't tell yourself things like, oh, I just don't get it. I'm not a programmer. My mind doesn't work like that. That's not going to help you in tennis. It's not going to help you in programming. You don't see people going up and learning tennis and saying, well, I'm just not a tennis player. Or, I just don't do forehand. I, I just do backhand. I'm just a backhand person. I, I don't get forehand. You're never going to learn to be a competent tennis player like that. You can always decide, I don't care about tennis. That's fine. But if you're going to be in this class, it is because you care about programming, because you enjoy programming, because you want to enjoy programming. The only way to enjoy programming is to do it. Just like the only way to become a good guitar player is to play guitar. You've got to practice. And just like learning guitar, you can ask your guitar teacher for help, but eventually it's going to be you on stage playing that thing, and you're going to have to be able to do it yourself. I love programming, and I want to communicate that enthusiasm to you. But in order to be a programmer, you need to spend time programming. There are real rewards with it, though. I think Fred Brooks articulated this really well in his book, The Mythical Man Month. He tried to answer this question, why is programming fun? And he came up with five reasons. I'll read you one or two of them. The first was just the joy of making things. And indeed, with a computer, you're actually making a program that does something. And you're not only that, you're making things that are useful. That's kind of awesome. And those things are complex. They're interesting. And so it's fun to just watch them. Like, I created this interesting, complex thing. Look at it work. It's fun. Every computer program is different. And as a result, it's not really a repetitive task. You're always learning something new. There's a new problem, a new variation. So programming is an endlessly stimulating activity as a profession. Brooks says, finally, there is the delight of working in such a tractable medium. The programmer, like the poet, works only slightly removed from pure thought stuff. They build their castles in the air from air, creating by exertion of the imagination. Few media of creation are so flexible, so easy to polish and rework, so readily capable of realizing grand conceptual structures. This is a wonderful fact of computer programming. Yet the program construct, unlike the poet's words, is real in the sense that it moves and works, produces visible outputs separately from the construct itself. It prints results, draws pictures, produces sounds, moves robot arms. The magic of myth and legend has come true in our time. One types the correct incantation on the keyboard and the display screen comes to life, showing things that never were nor could be. Computer programming is a very rewarding activity, but like any activity worth doing, it's not necessarily easy at first. You have to give yourself time. You have to commit and practice. But with practice, I promise anyone can program.